few announcements before the homily. First, a charitable portion of our tithe this weekend will go to the Latin Patriarchate of Jerusalem in support of the Christians in the Middle East. As the holy days have come upon us and our hearts and minds have turned to Bethlehem, the place of our Lord's birth, it's appropriate that we support the Christians that are still in conflict in that region. So we're happy to support this effort. I want to thank everyone who made donations toward our parish Christmas flowers. As you can see, they're very beautiful. I thank you for your generosity. This coming week, we have a unique schedule at the parish. This was sent to you in our electronic newsletter on Wednesday. It's also available on our website, but just to accentuate some things so that no one comes and it's not offered or thinks it's going to be offered and it's not there and various other things. So tomorrow, the parish office is closed. The church, off, church building is closed. We don't have public mass. That's on Monday. Tuesday is a regular schedule, and then Wednesday and Thursday were closed. But Thursday night, Wednesday and Thursday, we don't have daily Mass at noon. Thursday night, we start the feast day of Mary, Mother of God. So Masses are at 4 p.m., 5.30 on Thursday night, and then Friday morning at 9 and 11. So it's our weekend schedule, just Thursday and Friday. Reason why is it's a holy day of obligation. And we're under a dispensation, so if you need it, it's up applicable. But I just want to make sure that you are being sincere in what you need. So, for example, if you're here today, you should probably be at the Holy Day. If you're able to go grocery shopping and do various other things, you should come be in more, at worship. And I know sometimes you have to turn people away, but I've stressed. Saturday night and the vigils, so Thursday night for the Holy Day, we have plenty of room. So if someone chooses, hey, I'm going to go, but you come to one of these morning masses and you come at the last minute, you know you're not going to get in, right? So sometimes we have to say, all right, I have a commitment, I'm going to go. And then secondly, I'm going to be strategic, right? I'm able to come on Saturday night or I'm able to come on Thursday night, you do that. Don't ride this dispensation. Our obligation to worship God is a blessing. It's an empowerment given to us by baptism. So come to worship when you're able. Incidentally, the reason why Mother Church calls us on the first day of the new year to honor Our Lady is that we are to give the past year to God, and aren't we all ready to say goodbye to 2020, right? And then to give the patronage of the new year to Our Lady. So I hope you can come as you're able for this Holy Day. As a reminder, confessions will be heard after all of the Holy Day Masses. So that's Thursday evening and Friday morning. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. So Team Grace, as the church celebrates the Christmas season, we hear all the familiar stories from the Bible. We hear the biblical accounts of the exchange between Gabriel and Mary, the move to Bethlehem for the census, and the birth of Jesus, and his placement in a manger, a feeding trough in Bethlehem. All these stories stand out in our hearts and minds as Christian believers. But there's another part of the story. It is proclaimed by the church in this season, but it doesn't get the same press time as all the other stories. The overlooked part of the great Christmas story is the person of Joseph. This is Holy Family Sunday, and so it's appropriate for us to focus on all the members of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and yes, Joseph. Now admittedly, compared to Jesus, God made man, and Mary, who was preserved from all sin from the moment of her conception, Joseph is certainly the odd man out. Right? I sometimes feel bad for Joseph. If anything went wrong, in the Holy Family, they knew it was Joseph's fault, right? <laughs> he literally lived with perfect people. Some of us might live with people who think they're perfect, right? <laughs> but they really were perfect. And poor Joseph was the odd man out. And yet, he is an important part of this story. And his presence and his actions, they give us a different angle, a different perspective of what happened in all the events surrounding that first Christmas day. Now, incidentally, our theological tradition makes great room for Joseph. You might recall from your old catechisms that the highest praise of God, worship, is given to God alone. That's called latria in theology. Latria is reserved to God alone. But then Mary receives hyperdulia. That's like a supersized honor and reverence that's only given to Our Lady. And in all the other saints, they get, they get dulia, which is like common respect an honoring. But our tradition tells us that Joseph, Joseph gets protodulia because he's the proto, the first. He receives protodulia because he, among all the holy ones, he stands at the for forefront. He is the most eminent among all the holy ones after Our Lady. 
So what do we know about Joseph? And why does he get this protodulia? Well, we are told in the scriptures that Joseph was a just man. Now, such a designation would have been rare in his day, since the entire task of an Israelite was to live his or her entire life for, in, in righteousness, namely to live their entire lives in conformity to the teachings and to the law of God. To be just, therefore, was the goal of life's work. It would have been odd to call someone just while they were still living, and yet the scriptures describe Joseph as a just man. Now, while we live in a world of exaggerations, hyperboles, and public relations statements that many times make declarations of virtue or goodness or even competency without any merit and empty, the writers of the New Testament, the writer of the Gospel books, did not indulge in such things. When Joseph is declared a just man, it was a statement of fact. It was reality. Joseph was a just man. There were no overstatements or amplifications. It was a truthful statement of a man who loved God, who sought to follow him in all that he did and all that he was. Joseph was, by all accounts, a just man. He sought to honor God in everything he did. And we see that such an adherence to God transformed him. It allowed him to be the recipient of divine wisdom and to have great prudence. Let's just look at one example. When Mary, his betrothed, became pregnant, he could have made a big deal out of it. He could have played the victim. He could have embarrassed Our Lady and her family. By the law of Moses, he was given to write even to public stoning. If he had gone to the elders of the region and complained, they would have supported him. He would have dragged Our Lady out by the hair and watched the elders stone her. That was his right under the law of Moses. But Joseph was willing to let it go. He pursued a quiet divorce. Such, was, such a decision shows us not only his immense compassion, but also his immense humility. In the normal order of events, he was giving the woman the freedom to pursue a relationship with the biological father. In the normal state of affairs, if a betrothed woman would have become pregnant by another man, for the man to say, her betrothed, I release you of this promise, he was giving her the freedom to pursue this other relationship. Joseph was willing to do that. When God's angel, however, announced to him that the child was by the power of the Holy Spirit, Joseph didn't question it. He accepted it. And he accepted all that the angel said and all that God had communicated to him because he was a just man. This action demonstrated not only Joseph's, again, his obedience, but also, again, his immense humility. Because when Joseph agreed to bring Mary into his home, he was allowing the perception that he was the biological father and that he and Mary had broken the usual chastity that was a part of the betrothment period. But Joseph accepted it because it was asked by God. In addition, Joseph didn't squabble with the angel. When the angel tells him, you are to name the child Jesus. Now we may not know the cultural context. We may not understand what the angel is saying. It was a big ask, but Joseph was willing to do it because such an act usually performed on the eighth day of a boy's life during his circumcision was the public declaration by a man that the child was his own, that the child belonged to his family. That this naming was essential in Israelite culture since inclusion into the chosen people was by blood. If you were to try to convert into Judaism at the time of our Lord, you would have been sent away. Incidentally, even today, the Jewish people do not readily welcome converts. Go to a synagogue and tell the rabbi you'd like to become Jewish and he'll ask you to leave. Judaism is by blood. You don't convert into Judaism. The only exception is when a, mo a woman marries a Jewish man, they allow the woman to convert because they, it's unimaginable that a Jewish boy would have a Gentile mother. It's extremely rare. Inclusion into the chosen people was and is by blood. While the maternal line was needed for blood authenticity, and anyone could see and observe who the mother was, the declaration of the father, his acceptance, and his naming of the child was necessary 
since it was the man's statement that the child was his own. Such an act by the father gave the boy formal admittance into the Israel of God. And God asked Joseph to name Jesus, to claim him as his own. Unlike Roman culture and law, where adoption was very common, it was not a common practice among the Israelites. If a child somehow became parentless, the, the, the extended family simply stepped up and took care of things. If a boy was named on the eighth day by a man, that was his son, no questions asked. While theologically, we sometimes distinguish Joseph with the title foster father of our Lord or other such designations, in order to emphasize our Lord's virgin birth and our Lord's divine identity, such clarifications did not exist among the Israelites of Joseph's day. They wouldn't have known what you were talking about. Foster father, adopted father, it doesn't make any sense. Look at our scriptures today in the gospel. We are told that the boy's mother and father took him to Jerusalem for his presentation. The boy called Jesus by his father now became like Joseph, a son of Judah and a member of the house of David. He was a full Israelite by the naming and the acceptance by Joseph. And Joseph, who did all that was asked of him, named Jesus with humility and gratitude and a towering boldness, the pride of that Jewish heart when God asked him to name the divine, the Messiah, to name the Christ child. Joseph did what was asked, not simply with obedience, but with boldness. Look at how good Joseph was. Today we see him taking his family to worship. How many fathers have failed in that duty? How many Christians have failed in that duty? Joseph was attended, he obeyed. Whatever was asked, he did. Dear friends, in our discipleship, do we obey God? Do we obey the commands of the Lord, even when they're awkward, peculiar, or uncomfortable? Are we docile to the work of the Holy Spirit and his promptings within our heart? To the men among us who have been called by God to be fathers, are you taking your vocation seriously? Do you understand the sacrificial calling to which you have been summoned by God? Are you as obedient and unshakable as Joseph in the leadership of your family? Joseph did whatever was asked. In these ways, we can say that he was God's go-to man. God could trust Joseph. God asked and Joseph made it happen. This is why he is also the patron saint of the universal church. The entire body of believers on the earth look to Joseph as our patron. This is also why this year the Holy Father has named a special year of St. Joseph, asking every parish in the universal church to particularly honor Joseph, the man of God, the father of the Holy Family. Joseph showed himself to be, without question, and at all times, a truly just man. He did whatever was asked. He showed up, he did what was commanded, he gave his heart to Mary and to the Christ child. He was not divine, nor was he preserved from sin as Our Lady was, but he gave, always and without reserve, his five loaves and his two fish. He gave all that he had. To the fathers among us, are you as generous with your families as Joseph was to his? To all of us as Christians, are we seeking to do whatever God asks of us and to give God without reserve, in imitation of St. Joseph, our own five loaves and two fish?